right, well, let's, uh, let's get started. Uh, welcome everybody and uh, thank you for joining us um, for today's event. Um, I also want to, uh, this, you know, this event is being hosted by the Center for Asian Studies and the China Made Project. And I want to, um, first of all, uh, in addition to thanking you all for tuning in, uh, I wanna thank Liza Williams for helping get uh, today's event set up and supporting us in all the ways that she does for, for all of our events. So thank you, Liza, for, for uh, running the show for us uh, today. Um, the, uh, I also um, will put in the chat, um, I put this in earlier, but I think I need to put it in again for people who are interested. And we're also going to put some information about, um, about Murray's book and, and um, we're gonna put that in in a minute, but um, for, uh, for those of you who are interested in the uh, China Made Project, which is uh, co-hosting today's event, I've added the um, web link for that if you wanna visit the China Made webpage and learn more about it. Um, it's a project uh, funded by the Henry Luce Foundation for uh, exploring China's outbound infrastructure investment uh, with a regional focus on Southeast Asia. And so we are particularly glad to be able to um, have Mary Hebert here today to um, give us more, uh, more insight onto that situation. Um, you know, China's growing, a, uh, growing assertiveness uh, in foreign investment, particularly in the fields of infrastructure development, um, along with natural resource extraction has certainly garnered uh, much of the world's attention. Much of that attention has focused on China's signature initiative, the Belt and Road. And what this, uh, what Jonathan Hillman has called the project of the century uh, entails for the political economic, um, uh, for the global political and economic order. Um, at China Made, we've aimed to take a, a on the ground um, view of China's development projects, uh, particularly its infrastructure projects, and particularly its infrastructure projects in Southeast Asia. You know, we've been asking how are these projects embedded within Southeast Asian societies, cultures, um, politics? Uh, what do the on the ground effects of these projects tell us about a newly global China? Well, it is a huge help. Um, in this kind of work to have someone like Mary Hebert around to offer a comprehensive view of how Southeast Asia has responded to China's growing presence in the region. Um, Murray is a senior associate of the Southeast Asia program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies uh, in Washington, DC, where he's joining us um, from today. He brings to us a wealth of that on the ground experience and information in Southeast Asia. As a former senior director uh, for the US Chamber of Commerce, uh, a former journalist uh, for the Wall Street Journal and the Far Eastern Economic Review, he's written two books on Vietnam, uh, Chasing the Tigers from 1996 and Vietnam Notebook from 1993. And his newest book, um, which you'll be talking about today, uh, is Under Beijing's Shadow, Southeast Asia's China Challenge, um, right here. Just finished it, um, and we're going to learn more about that uh, here in a, here in a minute. Um, uh, it's a, it's packed with uh, detailed information from throughout the throughout the region, and as you'll see in a minute, Br Murray brings both a journalist's attention to detail um, and a strategic analyst's attention to larger scale political, economic, and security issues uh, in this book. So. Uh, I think we've added a link in the chat to um, where you can purchase the book. And I think there's even um, a discount flyer there as well for you all to um, take advantage of, hopefully, if, if you can, uh, uh, to get the book. Um, we also welcome your questions and comments in the chat. Uh, I'll do my best um, to get to them. Um, I'm not sure. Apologies in advance if we don't get to all your questions. Um, today, um, but uh, we'll do our best. Um, Murray will talk about the book for about 20 minutes or so, and then we'll see where the discussion um, takes us. So Murray Hebert, welcome to Boulder, <laughs> or wherever, <laughs> welcome to everywhere, welcome to the world. Uh, great to have you here. Uh, great. Yours. Great, thanks, Tim. Thanks for the opportunity and the invitation. 
Um, yeah, so uh, Tim uh, sort of uh, started introducing the book a little bit what it covers. So it really, it does look at how Southeast Asia, the 10 countries of Southeast Asia view China's rise. And really they view um, China with a mix of, of uh, challenge. They see Ch China as uh, both a challenge and an opportunity. Uh, the challenge being some of them are nervous about sovereignty, but the opportunity is tremendous uh, economic uh, growth possibilities with China's investment. Um, it, China, the book describes China's soft power, um, economic, cultural, educational um, engagement, and then more hard power, China's role, and maybe even some sharp power in the South China Sea and uh, along the Mekong. Um, I'm going to, uh, so I'll just go through some of these topics very quickly, and then we can pursue those that interest you in more detail. They, the Southeast Asian countries since 1979, when China opened up, really has viewed uh, China as soaring economic growth as an, uh, as, as an engine that's going to propel them out of poverty, fire up middle income. Uh, their middle income economies, finance infrastructure. China for most of the, I think all the Southeast Asian countries uh, uh, is the largest trading partner. In uh, 2019, China's trade with Southeast Asia was over well over 600 billion, twice that of the United States. Uh, and this heavy dependence on China caused, caused several countries to look to join the Trans-Pacific Partnership that which uh, President, former President Trump pulled out of. But China is much more of a trading heavyweight than an investment uh, juggernaut. It's greenfield investments. The, it's really hard to get figures, but the FT, the fi Financial Times did some, uh, released some figures a couple, uh, about a year and a half ago or so, suggesting that China's greenfield investment was around 123 billion in, in the Southeast Asian countries. That's, that's half that of Japan and well behind the United States. And as Tim suggested, the Belt and Road is, uh, is probably one of China's major vehicles since about 2013. It's, it's uh, uh, the project of the century, as Xi, Xi Jinping has called it. It builds railroads, roads, bridges, power stations, dams, and you name it, and they put everything in there from, they also put trade agreements and cultural exchanges into the Belt and Road, but uh, they bring not only tons of cash, but uh, buckets of financing, cement, technology, oodles of workers in some cases like, like Laos. Um, they, they, and, and they're really helping fill an infrastructure gap, especially in the l l lesser developed countries uh, and their other goal, of course, is to integrate, to make, uh, make Southeast Asia, make it easy to get to Southeast Asia with their surplus of, of products and, in, then, and, uh, and also to, to integrate these countries more closely with China and expand China's influence. Um, they, China and Southeast Asia have not released any macro figures on how much they've actually in, invested on the Belt and Road, but uh, a consulting company in Washington, RWR Associates, has done an estimate. They they have a Belt and Road newsletter, and they they did some calculations for me. I you know uh, I don't know how accurate they are. In fact, I think they're somewhat exaggerated because they they put the number uh, from 2013 to 2018 at 200 billion. Having visited all these countries. Um, uh, in recent years, I think that's that's pretty big, uh, that number. Um, the other thing that China faces is just a lot of problems. Uh, they have problems with land acquisition. Even in Laos, they face land acquisition. They had terrible problems in Indonesia trying to get the, the high-speed rail from Jakarta to Bandung going. Uh, they face implementation delays, getting approvals that they faced in Indonesia, faced it in the Philippines. Um, and then they, they, uh, they also face some grumpy uh, populations that are being ro relocated. This, you can talk to these people around projects in, in Laos or Myanmar, uh, 
uh, and even Indonesia where, where farmers were moved. Then the other big one is environmental challenges. The Mistone Dam in Myanmar, northern Myanmar, uh, they had a huge bunch of pushback. And even in Cambodia, uh, the lower Sisan II Dam uh, faced a lot of protest in Cambodia. And that is the country that's probably closer to China than any in Southeast Asia at this point. Corruption and kickbacks are a big problem. And in Malaysia, uh, when the prime minister that had signed a deal for the East Coast Rail Link was, was overthrown in, in May of 2018, the incoming prime minister, who was a former prime minister, Mahathir Mohamad, he, uh, he, he suspended the project for almost a year out of frustration at, at, at finding how much money China had paid under the table for helping to uh, bail out the uh, former Prime Minister Najib's uh, a 1MDB, 1 Malaysia Development Berhad. Um, there's also, there, and we could go on, there's situations like this in, in Laos and in, in Vietnam with a SkyTrain also. Uh, and then the other problem is, is ethnic Chinese workers, which are very sensitive in some countries. Uh, Indonesia probably being the, uh, having the most sensitivity. And uh, after COVID slowed down in China, some workers came back to Sulawesi in, in an island in, in southeastern uh, Indonesia. And we're going to work in mines and people locals really protested for months because they thought they were losing, they weren't getting the jobs, but their Chinese were coming in to do it. And the Chinese have a long history in Indonesia, which we can go into, which where they face an awful lot of suspicion after a coup in 1965 that, that ultimately was blamed on, on China. Um, who knows, it's, it's a little bit, there's the evidence isn't 100% convincing but there's a quite a bit of evidence too. Um, the, the, the area where China uh, might start focusing more because of all the other problems in the, in the hard infrastructure is the digital Silk Road. And they are now already a major investor in Indonesia and Singapore in particular uh, in online payment schemes on uh, and facial recognition technology, artificial intelligence, all that stuff. Huawei is very active uh, in the region. Uh, only Vietnam has told Huawei to, that they won't get a role. And Vietnam is probably the most historically, um, had, had the most trouble with China over the, over the centuries, over the millennia actually. Um, uh, and, but in Singapore and Vietnam said, we'll do it ourselves, the, do 5G ourselves, thank you very much. Singapore gave a lot of the contracts to Nokia and Ericsson, but gave a few peripheral ones to, um, to uh, uh, Huawei. Um, the other thing that's kind really interesting is that despite these problems, and China comes in kind of have big footed and heavy handed sometimes, but they do have quite a bit of flexibility and willingness to compromise. And, um, uh, you know, they are willing to renegotiate a project, change interest rates. Uh, maybe I should just tell the example of, of the Laos. The Laos Railroad, which you would have thought tiny Laos with 7 million people would not stand up to China, but for five years, they dragged their heels on getting the projects, the, 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 um, the high speed rail, which is really a medium speed rail uh, going. Um, they, they insisted on renegotiating the terms of the project. Initially, China wanted them to pay the full 6 billion. Uh, but in the end, that's a joint venture at, in which, in which uh, Laos is going to pay about 10% of that, around six, six, seven hundred million, uh, which is a loan from the Chinese. The interest rates were over 4%. They went down to around two. Uh, the Chinese wanted, uh, was it 100 meters on each side of the railroad so their guys could do business there? The Lao got them down to. I'm trying to remember 15 or 18 meters. And, and they changed the ownership style, which first Laos was going to own the whole thing. And now, now, now China, com Chinese companies have a share too. So, and that really has happened in a number of cases where China has been willing to renegotiate. Um, the other thing they do is provide political support. So 
uh, to to countries. So after after Myanmar uh, uh, kicked out in a brutal fashion, kicked out close to a million uh, Rohingya uh, Muslims in 2017 and 2018. Most of them ended up in Bangladesh, Chi China. Very quickly. The, the West, United States, Europe, everybody really went after Myanmar and Aung San Suu Kyi and re, with, uh, you know, canceled, pulled back all her awards and that kind of thing. Um, they, the, but China, Wang Yi came there in the middle of all this, at the foreign minister and uh, told, told, you know, offered a lot of support. The other place they do it is, of course, in Cambodia, which has gotten rather, has, has, um, uh, uh, withdrawn the authorization for the opposition party, threw in the the uh, the lead leader uh, 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 so uh, Kim Sok Ha in prison, um, and but China really has stood stood by uh, Cambodia while the foreign aid is being withdrawn. Um, so there's some form uh, some polls that are taken from time to time, and probably the most famous polling outfit is the Institute for Southeast Asian Studies in Singapore. And uh, they, you know, the, the, the traditional perception is that, uh, that uh, the Southeast Asians look to China for trade and economics. They look to the US for security. Uh, that started to change quite dramatically under President Trump. Uh, who questioned, he pulled out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, questioned alliances, launched a trade war against China, which is a major trading partner with Southeast Asia. So um, uh, the views of the US got more complicated. Um, but in, this, in the poll released exactly a year ago, 79% of Southeast Asians polled, and this is an elite poll, it's polling academics, government officials, businessmen, journalists, NGOs, et cetera. 79% uh, said China was, had the most economic influence in the region. Less than 8% thought that about the United States. 52% uh, China said, said China had the most political and strategic influence in the region. Only 27% thought that about the United States. I, I should have looked up. I don't remember what those numbers were uh, when in 20, uh, the first poll in 2018 when, when President Trump took office. Um, it, China has, a, a tr as I've alluded to a few times, has, has had a complicated history in the region. Um, v Vietnam's history is probably the longest. It uh, shortly before the uh, before the uh, what do we call it the Chris I don't know what we call it when zero stuff we went from from BC to AD that um, uh, Vietnam was colonized for a thousand years and uh, quite a quite a harsh crackdown uh, and um, the many and after the communists won in in 1949 China supported communist forces in virtually all the Southeast Asian countries including Indonesia, Myanmar, uh, Thailand, Malaysia, et cetera. Ch ethnic Chinese play a major role in the region. Over the years, millions of ethnic Chinese have migrated to Southeast Asia. Uh, a couple of, uh, of centuries ago, it was mainly a, a landless Southeast Asia, a landless South Chinese. Um, but late, and then later, some were brought in, like by the British in Malaysia and Singapore, to help with the colonial uh, functions, as well as uh, mine tin and uh, produce rubber. Uh, they play a very different role today. Uh, there's some suspicion in countries uh, like Indonesia, uh, Vietnam. Uh, but in, in places like Cambodia, they serve as a very important matchmaker between uh, uh, China and Cambodia. Uh, in Thailand, they're very integrated into the society. Uh, and so they play a very major role in the economy. Um, the other thing I need to say about migration is that it is, has really uh, ramped up. Uh, mi migration has really ramped up in recent years. 
So now in northern Myanmar, uh, the whole swath of northern Myanmar, north of Mandalay, it's ethnic Chinese doing everything from running, uh, running the markets to, to growing uh, things like rubber and bananas and watermelons and all that stuff. They're doing the same in northern Laos uh, in Lung Namta province. Um, uh, and this is causing some anxiety in the region, and there's some questions about whether this could, in the long term, start affecting the the um, uh, uh, sort of the cultural makeup, and therefore have political implications going forward. But then, in the cities in Vientiane, Laos, in Bangkok, Thailand, Manila, in uh, Sihanoukville in Cambodia, in um, Phnom Penh in Cambodia, you have tens of thousands of, of ethnic Chinese coming. Uh, in in, in uh, Vientiane, Laos, they run a huge market, probably about five or eight, 10 square uh, blocks. I don't know how big it is, maybe not 10, but certainly seven or eight, probably. Um, Bangkok, they have some of their own enclaves. Manila, they're very big on, on, um, on um, online gaming. Uh, and so uh, that was very controversial because Duterte, the president of, Indonesia, of, of Philippines, allows it to continue, although China has asked him to cut it off. China asked Hong Sen in Cambodia to cut it off, and he did, and the, the ethnic Chinese, uh, a lot of them left Cambodia, the, ga the gaming people, and went to Western, uh, to Eastern um, uh, Myanmar and Cayenne State, Karen State, uh, Liza, could you put up the South China Sea map, please? So I'm going to switch now to talk a little bit about some of the big challenges that uh, that that exist. Um, and the, on the map, you can see the big the 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 dark dashed line that comes down along the side of of uh, of Vietnam and then goes down to Borneo and Malaysia and then up uh, across the Philippines. That's China's uh, uh, so-called nine dash line, which China claims all that territory in, inside uh, this area. And um, uh, in the recent years, the last two years, China has been very active off the coast of Southern Vietnam, uh, close to where the Vietnam is, uh, the word Vietnam is on that map. And then also off the coast of of, of Borneo, of Sabah and Sarawak, where it says Malaysia. They have been really harassing uh, oil and exploration, excuse me, harassing oil exploration, exploration efforts by, by companies that Vietnam has brought in. For example, Rosneft, the Russian state-owned company. And then uh, off the coast of Malaysia, they've been harassing Shell. And they did that for several months in 19, in 2019 and 2020. Uh, China's goal appears to be to force Vietnam, Malaysia. Philippines has also been harassed, but earlier, uh, not to work with foreign oil companies to develop oil and gas. Um, so the, the thing, uh, I guess, the tensions really started in the uh, mid 1970s when China took the Paracel Islands from, from the South Vietnamese government. That's the little dot of islands in the northern part of the South China Sea, just below Hainan Island, and then Johnson Reef, which is on the edge of uh, and Mischief Reef, and Scarborough Shoal, which all are in the Paracels or close to the Paracels. Uh, the Spratleys, rather, which is the group that's uh, further south, close to, to Borneo, close to Malaysia. Um, in 2013, China began building artificial islands. Uh, they built seven of them now, and four of which are equipped with airfields and military aircraft, radar, missile installations, so that China is getting increasing control over the South China Sea. It could it can fly planes from those bases to any capital in Southeast Asia by now. Uh, and it is pressing uh, the locals, the, the Southeast Asians rather, to, to, to arrest their fishermen, to stop them from going into the, within the nine dash line and uh, not, to, um, not to press forward with oil and gas exploration, which all these countries desperately need for economic growth. Uh, Liza, let's go to the Mekong map, please. And then I'll, I'll just talk briefly about uh, the other tension, which is manure, 
is the um, uh, the Mekong River, which in recent years has uh, become uh, more tense. Uh, this is a map of Laos from my book. I didn't have one that showed the whole Mekong River, but the most interesting thing the, the Mekong begins in north uh, begins in, in in Tibet and comes down, and the 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 black the dark lines inside uh, that are actually in China are, are dams uh, that China has built. I don't, I think two, four, I only have six there. It, it should be, ele it's 11 by now, uh, hydropower dams. Uh, and they, they um, and then it has also built, uh, financed or built quite a few dams further down in, in Laos and, and Cambodia. Uh, these dams, they're hydropower dams to, to produce electricity. Um, they uh, affect the water flow. They have cut sediment. Uh, they cut fish. And the fish migration is just south of, of Laos is Cambodia. And in the middle of Cambodia, you have the Tonle Sap Lake, which grows, expands during rainy season and shrinks during the dry season. Um, it is a major fish uh, a fish uh, 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 breeding uh, area, uh, and it's it's with without without uh, and so what we've had in the last few years is the water being uh, not there's a partially a drought and partially China is blocking water and that those two things combined cause a severe drought in in uh, in um, in Cam in Th Laos Thailand. Uh, Cambodia and Vietnam, and it is raising very serious concerns about uh, what what China is doing by building these dams at home, but also what it's doing by by facilitating through aid uh, dams at uh, in, in Laos. It's built uh, built one or two in Cambodia also, and the the blocking of sediment matters very much for the Mekong Delta. In, in, in Vietnam, which um, uh, is below sea level. And for Laos, it's, Laos uh, has a, a massive amount of debt to China for, for the dams that it's built, not only on the uh, two or three uh, on the mainstream of the Mekong, but some on tributaries. And Laos has giant uh, 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 buckets of debt that it owes to China. And one of its companies, EDL uh, Transmission, which is their, their distribution company, uh, uh, their grid basically, they were in such trouble, they couldn't pay finance the, their, their debt, couldn't um, service their debt. So they actually gave a, a Chinese company, China Southern Power Grid Company, a big chunk of over 50%, actually close to 90% of their company uh, in September of this year, which is starting to raise some concerns in Southeast Asia, whether other countries are going to start facing debt problems. I'll just, and I see I'm getting at the, past the 20 minute mark. So I'm gonna speed through a couple of things. Military cooperation is increasing. They're, uh, China's selling more weapons. Thailand has ordered uh, almost 30 tanks and three subs, submarines, although two of them have been delayed uh, for financing reasons by the Thai. Uh, they're building uh, pa coastal patrol vessels for Malaysia. They're, they're building these, these things for, for countries with which they're having tensions. It's kind of bizarre. Um, and, and then Myanmar and Cambodia have long depended on China for weapons. They have more, uh, China has more military exchanges uh, with countries, but they, and if some exercises, but much fewer than those that the US still has. And then on the, and there's increasing intelligence that China is building, uh, using a naval base in Cambodia at the Reem Naval Base, which is, if you know where, where Sihanoukville is, it's just, uh, just east of, uh, just west of Sihanoukville a base that would put them in the basically the Gulf of Thailand and raises a lot of concerns in the region. We can talk more about that if you want. And then um, soft power uh, uh, scholarships, uh, lots of scholarships for students, inviting uh, a lot of students. 
uh, probably in the or closer to close to 100,000 uh, in recent years. Um, to, uh, about a quarter of those come from Thailand, a big chunk come from Indonesia, over 10% come from Vietnam. The other big, big money earner for Southeast Asia before the onslaught of COVID was tourists. So tourists have been coming in, in increasing numbers and, and, and uh, uh, you know, over 40 million in 2019. And economies now that are very dependent on, on um, tourists like Thailand have really been hit by, by the cut, the suspension of tourism under COVID. Um, I'll just talk briefly about, uh, yeah, and then I'll conclude with just the political uh, influence. Um, that we, we know much more about China's political influence in countries like Australia, New Zealand, where they have been, where they've elected members, uh, ethnic Chinese, ch Chinese migrants to parliament, not the Chinese, the locals have elected these people to parliament where they get involved in various committees and it creates some real concerns when, when some of them get into like the intelligence or foreign affairs committees. Um, but we haven't seen that really in Southeast Asia, that direct. Uh, in Cambodia, they helped uh, uh, support the election commission and uh, uh, that was involved in running the elections uh, in 2018, uh, 2019 rather. Um, they, we as people assume that Duterte got money from the Chinese through ethnic Chinese in Davao City, where he was the mayor. It's it's widely assumed that uh, the United Front Department of the Central Com Central Committee is of China is actively working with overseas Chinese to try to neutralize their criticism, also uh, tone down democratic activists, uh, uh, try to silence the supporters of Tibet. Uh, Xinjiang, Taiwan. Uh, China is taking a lot of, uh, not a lot, but a, a fair number of, of Muslims from Malaysia and Indonesia to Xinjiang to, to influence their views on the treatment of Uyghurs. Some come back with quite a positive uh, uh, description of that being a, basically a summer camp type atmosphere where they can pray five times a day, can eat halal food have flowers on their tables, et cetera. Um, they're, they're getting, in, China is getting increasingly involved in the media, uh, especially cable television, uh, where in some countries there's at least half a dozen China sponsored China language news and documentary channels that are, are, are supported by the mainland, but come from, mostly from Hong Kong and Taiwan. Uh, hacking is a big problem. Uh, uh, China regularly hacks into um, uh, Southeast Asian government uh, websites. Uh, ahead of the APEC meeting in Vietnam in 2017, when both Xi Jinping and, and President Trump were gonna attend, uh, they hacked in to try to figure out what the Vietnamese were planning to do. It's just, you know, their APEC is a little bit like watching paint dry, it's not, not very, nothing moves very fast, but they thought they should know for Xi what, what, what they were gonna discuss. And before South China Sea discussions in ASEAN, often the, uh, the Chinese hack into the foreign ministry or other sources to try to understand what Vietnam's goal views are on the South China Sea. So Tim, I think I'm gonna stop there. I've gone a little bit longer than I hope to. Um, um, uh, sorry that's about that. That's great, that's great. I mean, it really, uh, you know, for those of you who haven't um, who haven't read the book, um, you know this just this just touches the scratches the surface really of of a tremendous amount of detail and um, uh, uh, research that went into this book. And so um, there's an awful lot that we could talk about. Um, and uh, I want to just start with um, just a couple uh, thoughts for you to to think about or to to reflect on. Um, and, and that has to do with what, um, what the experience that China has had in Southeast Asia, the kind of pushback it's gotten or the kinds of things that you document in the book, um, particularly in the context of the, the Belt and Road Initiative and other kind of Chinese um, uh, investment initiatives in the region. You know, what does that tell us, do you think, um, 
about, uh, in, in a more general sense, about um, China's outbound uh, policies and approaches where the Belt and Road Initiative might be going. Um, to what extent, you know, to what extent can we think about Southeast Asia as a, um, as a, as a kind of a signal um, that tells us something broader about this? I mean, one of the, obviously, you know, Southeast Asia has been identified as, as one of the most strategically important parts of China's um, outbound initiatives, uh, the strategic center of the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, China has long, long historic ties, obviously, in Southeast Asia, um, uh, long ties with, with uh, long-term migration and, and, and other things. Um, and I think a lot of people felt like, well, if, if China can succeed anywhere with a lot of the initiatives that it's been um, putting out there, it would be Southeast Asia. And yet, as you document in the book, things have not gone smoothly at all. Um, for for a lot of different reasons, although we it's we also can't really generalize across the region because there's such a diversity of of different um, countries and different governments and different societies and different reactions to China and different ways of, that um, China has had to in, engage. So um, you know what does what does what is hap what you've seen happening in Southeast Asia in terms of China's uh, investments there? What might that tell us about where the Belt and Road is going? Um, in 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 the near future, um, in terms of you know have 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 we seen uh, have we seen its peak and uh, the declines we've seen um, in Southeast Asia and the difficulty China has had in Southeast Asia is that just foretell, uh, foretell a broader pattern that we can expect to see in other parts of the world? Um, we've also seen China, as you mentioned, shift from the kind of hard infrastructure investment push that it. The, the Belt and Road Initiative started with to much more kind of soft infrastructure emphasis on digital, uh, the digital Silk Road, um, uh, those kinds of things that um, are more in the short term profitable, right, for, um, for China's uh, state-owned enterprises in particular. Um, so there's a, so what is, what, what do we learn from what we've seen China do in Southeast Asia that, that we can take in a broader picture? Oh, there's a lot of questions there. You packed a lot in there. Um, um, I think it seems like by the numbers we can get that China sort of gave its, um, uh, the, the biggest investments were in around 2015. Every year since then, they've sort of been lower. Uh, that's one thing. Um, the, they, I think they, they come on rather tone deaf sometimes. Uh, big and try to bigfoot the situation. So in Myanmar, they they are still mad that that Myanmar canceled the uh, Mistone Dam in 2011. That's a long time ago, but the uh, Xi Jinping still raises it and call phone calls with Aung San Suu Kyi. Um, they're offended by that and they want the they use that as leverage to push the the Myanmarese, the Burmese to uh, to be more uh, accommodating. Uh, on their other projects, because one of the big ones they want is they want an access to the Indian Ocean. On, at Chakpiu, they want to build a port. And um, the, the Mer Myanmar sees no value in it. That, that uh, area in, in, um, in Western Cambodia on the Indian Ocean has virtually a very small population, no industry. Um, so they're just they're just holding back, and they smile and they sign more MOUs, and they don't move ahead. Uh, so that's so China is going to, I think, um, have to um, learn to talk to the local population, put their finger in the air, and see which way the wind is blowing a little bit. Even in I told this story of uh, Lower Sisan Tu Dam in in Cambodia, and Hung Sen has said. Uh, the, China's best friend in Southeast Asia said no dams for no dams for ten years. He said that last year. Um, so yeah, so that they 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 realize, uh, and part of it is they. So it's assumed that that these projects are are involve quite a bit of aid, but actually it's quite a bit of loans. Uh, and I I try to very quickly tell a little bit of the story of Laos, but but. All these countries are accumulating debt. So, so China's, if, if you negotiate, like in the case of Laos, they will 
they will loan to a local comp they will create a local company but even that local company has to repay the debt and then they carry they then they 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 say the arrest is held by Chinese companies, but you know who knows exactly where. Ultimately, the, these loans are very murky and un, untransparent, so we don't actually know what country, companies are going to finally be responsible for. And the the interest is pretty high. They usually start around four percent or more from the Exxon Bank and the and the China Development Bank. So. They have lowered the interest rates on a, for for the Lao and the Thai, um, but uh, even you know in Malaysia, uh, uh, Jokowi not Malaysia in in Indonesia, Jokowi realized the pre president realizes that in that China has a bad image, and so he's pushed all the projects way to the margin. He has them in Sulawesi and Kalimantan, Sumatra, and. He doesn't do anything. They, the Chinese are kept out of Java, the population as center and the and the power center, um, and and then you on top of that off you have Chinese. I think complaining more at least since about 2018 or so, 2017 maybe. I found quite a bit of mumbling in in op eds in in uh, in social media that. Uh, we're doing all the, it's it's sounds very similar to what what some people on, in Congress complain about. Why are we giving all this aid to these foreign countries when we have hungry and and uh, and poor and people in our country and our health system is quite bad shape. So I, China will have to uh, redesign this whole thing, and I think it's happening. Uh, she recognized at the at the summit in in April 2019 that he hosted that they had to deal with corruption, they had to deal with environment, they had to deal with labor standards to some extent. So I, I think, you know, I think China will, will be more cautious and try and probably be more socially responsible going forward. But, you know, that's a, a faith statement. It's not a, a guarantee. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing, one of the things we have seen is um, a, a, an attempt anyway to, or, or a process by which um, what China's doing is, is evolving. Um, and it may not be evolving in ways that um, everyone intends or has complete control over, but um, I think we definitely see um, changes and efforts to make changes. And sometimes those are, those are more successful than others. Um, Tim, can I just say one other thing about yeah. that? The yeah. thing that, you know, when you talk about China, what are you talking about? Right. So there, the China that that I describe in the book, but I, I off even there, I don't have the ability to be so nuanced. You have the central China, the, the Beijing policies, you have the provincial policies from, from um, uh, Yunnan and uh, Guangxi province, uh, you have the, the, the big conglomerates, the big state-owned enterprises, and then you have the local cowboys, you know, and then that, that's not that different than American investment back in the day, but it comes from many sources. And, and the more local you are, you probably are, you know, going to be a little bit more uh, wild and woolly in some of your activities. We have a, uh, a few questions um, in the chat. I'll get to those here in a sec. Just want to remind people, if you have a question, um, you can post it in the chat. Um, you, if you um, want to raise your hand, we will do our best to get to you and, and unmute you. And, and you can ask your question um, live and in person, as, as in person as we get these days. Um, the kind of this, this does come from um, a question that um, Andrew Coletti raised uh, uh, going into the event when, uh, 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 about um, the U.S. reaction, right? How should, what should the U.S. political and econ economic response um, be to China's Belt and Road Initiative uh, with regards to how we respond to China, with regards to U.S., how, how U.S. approaches um, Southeast Asia? Um, you know, I mean, I think there's, there's obviously all sorts of dimensions about that question um, there are many, many dimensions about that question that we could think about in terms of, you know, the new Biden administration, um, what kinds of uh, 
you know, to what extent, I suppose, um, will Southeast Asia, should Southeast Asia become a, a site of kind of competition between the US and, and China? Um, do you see the US engaged, um, committed to engaging on the ground at the same kind of uh, level that we see with China, well, and Japan, really, for that matter? Um, mm. What do you think? Uh, what do you think the U.S. should do, and what do you think they will do in Southeast Asia? Ah. Well, um, I, I really, the Southeast Asians would like the U.S. there. They like the Japanese there, as you were alluding. South Koreans are becoming more active, um, also as investors. Europeans are becoming more active investors. Um, they would like a balance to China. They, they really don't want sing, you know be solely dependent on China, for sure. Um, but China is throwing so much at this. The U.S. is is you know it's it's totally different uh, situation where the big banks in China are state owned and they're they're told by the government to give loans to this state owned enterprise that's going to go and build this railroad. Uh, the U.S. has nothing like that. Um, the U.S. government can't tell any banks to give loans, and the companies are going to go where they think they're going to make money rather than. Where the where it might make strategic sense, uh, and so uh, I think you know one of the things that happened toward the end of the Trump administration was the formation of the Development Investment Corp, you know, De De Development DFC, De Development Finance Corporation, the old OPEC, um, and, but they got eighty billion dollars from Congress, and it barely got got appropriated and then just barely got handed out by the time the Trump guys left town. But, but there, that has the opportunity of investing with the US private sector, with the Japanese private sector, with the Japanese government, so that you could start competing a little bit. Um, the, the US needs to find some ways to engage. Pulling out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership was a pretty, uh, the, the people viewed that, as, even the ones that weren't members like Thailand, Indonesia, viewed that as a, as a huge step backward. Um, and since then, they have negotiated the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, the RCEP, and the US is just sort of missing in action, trying to figure out what to do next. Um, the, the US, US companies are big, big investors and bigger than Chinese, and that's noticeable. US trade is significant, but it needs to be there in a more official capacity economically also. What will Biden do? You know, we, we, um, what the Southeast Asians are really worried about, and they were worried about this under Trump already, was that the, the cold, the, the Cold War as it was heating up between, the trade war as it was heating up between China and, and the United States could easily end up uh, catch uh, ensnaring them and that they would have to choose. Um, and they're especially worried when, when the uh, uh, Trump administration was, was barring China from buying uh, uh, semiconductors and, and other technology, uh, digital technology, because they're worried that they're gonna have, the, the, the Southeast Asians are suppliers to both markets uh, on, on this stuff. And, and they were very worried there'd be a bifurcation of the of digital and so their Chinese would have, will have one system in the US another and they're going to be sort of caught in between have to try to function in both. Um, and they feel that if there's a, a really a major trade war that it'll cause an economic downturn and it uh, in the whole region and it could, you know, with the South China Sea being um, uh, kind of um, a tinderbox, you could even see a military accident happen that takes both countries further than they really want it to go. So, but um, the, the, the Trump guys in many ways, they viewed Southeast Asia through the prism of China relations. Uh, and so countries that were important in that scheme, Vietnam being probably the biggest, <laughs> Uh, had pretty good relations, although Trump was really livid with them and threatened to put tariffs on them because they had a huge trade 
surplus, not realizing that if you, if you put tariffs on Chinese goods, uh, trade is going to divert and you're going to have the Vietnamese become the suppliers of a lot of that stuff. Um, uh, I, I, but, but where's Biden going to go? We don't know yet what he's going to do in, in the trade front at all. He, he said in his speech about buying American the other day that, that uh, uh, he doesn't want to get into any trade agreements with with foreign countries until he's guaranteed the secure economic security for American workers. Uh, so that's going to be a big focus. Um, uh, does do they go into, you know, the, the thing that they could do, which is less much less lower profile, it, uh, and doesn't require congressional ratification, like a free trade agreement our our sector agreements. So you could do digital or environmental products, or you could do various, like the digital, uh, the example would be like the digital agreement between Japan and the US. Um, but they're, they're barely um, getting, uh, the sec Secretary of State was just confirmed yesterday. Uh, and, and so a lot of the bodies are still missing uh, from the key posts. Um, I think they all, in some ways, they have to recognize that Southeast Asia is important in its own right. And that's what the Southeast Asians want. It's the third or fourth largest trading partner with the United States. So it does matter. It's not, you know, uh, irrelevant, obviously smaller than, than China, Canada, and Mexico. But after that, it's, it's, so it's the fourth largest trading partner. Yeah. I mean, on this topic, uh, Stan Harsha adds some thoughts and a question that he asks, um, you know, where he says, as I recall from the latest ISIS survey, only the EU is viewed with trust throughout Southeast Asia, um, the US, China, and even Japan, uh, not that trusted. Um, and so I, I think partly this is a question about, you know, not only what the US might be able to do in terms of trade and those kinds of initiatives, but, um, bouncing back in terms of uh, repairing um, that lost sense of trust. Um, yes. No, it's a very good point. Yeah. yeah, they do have to, US has to rebuild trust. And they, they like the tone of, of Biden. Um, they wonder if it's gonna be, uh, you know, rebalance to Asia 2.0, or we're gonna continue with the in, free and open Indo-Pacific. I think they'll change the Trump name. But I don't think they'll go back to rebalance to Asia either or pivot. Um, yeah, we just don't know yet. Nobody's in the saddle. Uh, to, but he, well, a couple of things he said, Trump did say, is he believes in alliances and he wants to, to work with regional groupings. So I think that would suggest that the ASEAN Association of Southeast Asian Nations 10 country grouping would be more important that it would suggest that in APEC, the uh, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum, those would be more important. And that maybe somebody higher than the head of the National Security Council or the, com uh, the Commerce Secretary would show up to some of these meetings. <laughs> yeah, that, that brings us to a question that George Taylor raised about um, ASEAN, right? About, about, you know, if we shift over to the Southeast Asian side of the picture and, and talk a little bit more about what the reaction of ASEAN has been uh, to, to China, to, to recent developments. You know, I mean, you point out very clearly, in fact, you, you, know, you organize your book in, uh, along the lines of the kind of the bilateralism that China has approached Southeast Asia with, right? China prefers to deal with countries on a one-to-one -one basis. Mm -hmm. um, Southeast uh, ASEAN has been kind of largely ineffective at um, presenting a unified uh, front and kind of dealing with China. Um, do you see that changing? Do you, you know, what, what, what's the ongoing role of ASEAN in all of this? Well, um, you know, ASEAN is like maybe a, a typical US family during the Trump administration, very divided. <laughs> uh, um, At Thanksgiving meals with all the years together. Your Uncle Harry or whatever, right? <laughs> um, yeah, they're a very different place. Um, so uh, uh, on the South China Sea, for example, uh, Vietnam is often pushed, Vietnam, Philippines in different times have pushed uh, 
uh, ASEAN to make statements, stronger statements, condemning what China did, maybe taking over Scarborough show like they did in 2012, for example, from the Philippines. Um, but uh, 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 Cambodia, uh, because of the, of the largesse it gets from China, is pretty reluctant to go along. And so they, they block it. And if ASEAN needs consensus to achieve anything. Um, and so if they don't have, if one, one guy can block it, it's like one guy in the Senate can block a confirmation hearing or something. Um, uh, yeah, so it's, it's the same formula. And uh, I don't see ASEAN as united enough to, um, to really work together against uh, China, even Malaysia, that I told the story of how Vietnam, Malaysia were being harassed. Malaysia, Vietnam went somewhat public, not fully public, but somewhat public. Malaysia was denying anything was happening, never told journalists about it at all. It was satellites that figured out what was going on and th those broke it rather than Malaysian government. Um, so I don't see much, much hope there uh, that I don't know if in the Mekong it could get different with China holding back so much water and it affecting uh, f Myanmar is only a tiny little section of the river so it doesn't affect it very much but it affecting Laos, Thailand, Cambodia and Vietnam would would Thailand, Cambodia and Laos to put pressure on China be willing to get the rest of ASEAN to support uh, the uh, pressure, putting pressure on China and saying, look, you give us all this aid, you give us all these, these cr mostly credits, but then you destroy our economy. Uh, you destroy 60 million farmers live along the Mekong and uh, you are destroying their livelihoods. They can't fish, they can't farm rice, they can't grow vegetables. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, you, I think, China could be pressured to, to be a little more forthcoming, giving them information on how much water it's holding back, when it plans to release it, that kind of thing. And maybe even to press to share a little more water because China keeps all the water, much of the water during the rainy season so that it can produce electricity in the dry season, which kills the Southeast Asians down South. Yeah. Yeah, and, and kind of along those lines, um, you know, Greg Haynes has a question about, you know, China's aggressive military behavior. I, th I think he's thinking of the South China Sea here um, and how that can be justified in the context of the kind of soft power <laughs> initiatives or um, uh, soft power efforts that China, uh, you know, engages in in the region and the, con the contradiction there or how, you know, how, how has China tried to <laughs> do both of those things at the same time and, and how does it work? Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's gambling that it's really putting pressure on about four countries and in di at different times. And so it's going to roughly get away with it. Uh, and it's not the military that does most of this. China, you might have seen on, on some of you may have seen in the news on Friday, the Chinese legislature passed legislation allowing the, the, uh, the Coast Guard, which typically is not an offensive um, uh, organization to shoot at at uh, other vessels and that they didn't clarify what those vessels were at least I haven't seen that they have so it could they can shoot at um, and they're huge vessels they're not this relatively small ones you see off the coast of the United States they're mother ships um, they're like aircraft carriers um, and they uh, uh, they and the uh, maritime marine vessels that do a lot of the patrolling uh, can harass fishermen, they harass the oil and gas exploration. Uh, and then, of course, they have also uh, earlier uh, uh, taken whole, whole islands from, from um, countries. They took the, the paracels from Vietnam, all of them. They um, took the Mischief Reef from the Philippines, took Scarborough Shoal from the Philippines, Johnson Reef from the... So they, they've done this over the years. But the, the main, and then they, ha, they have militarized. So one reason that China can harass the oil and gas guys 
so rigorously. That's a long way from China, but they now have these installations right in the middle, military installations in the middle of the ocean. And so it is possible for them to, to refuel. It's closer for them to go to refuel at, at Fiery Cross than it is for the Vietnamese to go back to their shore and get refueled and, and re, you know, restocked. They don't really, they just say, uh, they ignore the protests. They say this, it's historically ours. And, you know, even though they are signers of the UNCLOS, the UN Convention of Law of the Sea, uh, which does give other, other countries substantial chunks of the South China Sea, as I showed on that, described on that map, where it, it showed the area around Vietnam, Malaysia, Philippines. Maybe I should have spent a little more time there, but um, uh, they don't really, they just, they, they just reject talking about this, uh, about the South China Sea. And they say, if you wanna talk about it, we'll talk about with ASEAN, they'll talk about it one-on-one. -on -one. So the Phils wanna talk to them or the Vietnamese, they'll do it, but um, not with the group. I have a question um, about you know about um, China's in investments in digital infrastructures in Southeast Asia, and this is something I brought up earlier as kind of a, a way that, that we might see the Belt and Road uh, projects shifting more towards the digital Silk Road and more towards these kinds of soft infrastructures. And the question is simply about whether there's concerns about censorship. Um, but I'm wondering if you could um, ex you know talk a little bit about. Uh, some of the reactions you might have been hearing in Southeast Asia, you know, Huawei is obviously more welcome there than than, than in the U.S. or maybe other parts of the world. Um, is that accompanied by um, concerns that as this as these infrastructures become more prominent, as China is supplying them more to the governments in Southeast Asia, is that going to also translate into um, a more restricted um, internet environment? One funny quote I, I, I got from a Indonesian official, he said, you know, China isn't the first superpower to spy on us, which <laughs> sort of makes a pretty fine point. But yeah. uh, so That's they knew there. <laughs> uh, they um, um, so China does organize uh, cyber kind of uh, cyber laws, uh, cyber security uh, meetings. And I know that uh, the Filipinos have been there, the Vietnamese have been there. The Vietnamese were there shortly before they passed their own cybersecurity law uh, in 2018 that went into effect last year uh, in 2020. Um, uh, Thailand has adopted some of those measures. So uh, it is having, and China is having an impact uh, China showing them how to do some of this stuff. Now, none of them have been willing to go as far as China with, uh, but uh, Vietnam, like Vietnam uh, uh, has not barred um, uh, Facebook or Twitter, but it, it has forced those guys through their cybersecurity law to those companies to onshore. So they have to keep, uh, they have to keep the data onshore and if, if the Vietnamese security apparatus asks them to take it down, they have to take it down. Uh, and this has been especially a uh, prickly issue because Vietnam started a party Congress, the Communist Party Congress on Monday, and they get pretty nervous before party Congresses. And so, um, yeah, they've really put the screws to Facebook and Twitter, but let them stay. Yeah. Uh, you, you can get Gmail, you can get Washington Post or New York Times in Hanoi. Uh, they haven't gone nearly as far as China, but they've picked up some of those elements. And the reason they, do, they don't go further is, I think, because they want to be a major player in the digital space as a manufacturer. And if they suddenly shut this off, they will be, uh, they will, they will be viewed much more, much more negatively. Yeah, uh, uh, there's, I'm, I'm imagining in my head a, a map that I often see um, showing um, Facebook link, you know, Facebook connectivities around the world. And of course, there's this big dark spot where China is, but then Southeast Asia is one of the most lit up spots in the entire world. Yeah. Um, and certainly, uh, especially I think Indonesia. <laughs> Indonesia is crazy. Yeah. More, more than any of them. Yeah. Um, mm. And so, uh, 
So that's an interesting because I mean I, I do think China does want to present itself as an alternative model of of <laughs> of a different kind of internet. Um, Mm. That uh, and and whether or not Southeast Asia ends up being kind of the um, the, uh, the battleground uh, where those different models compete with each other is an interesting question. Or does uh, Southeast Asia try to set up a hybrid formula, right. be halfway between the two? Yeah, yeah. Um, Jackie Amio asks a question about um, whether you could talk about the potential long-term impact um, of all the Chinese scholarships going to students in the region. Um, the development of overseas branches of Chinese universities in the region and China's policy of having universities across China offer graduate degrees in English in fields that uh, meet the needs of, of regional countries. Um, and, it, you know, and I'll just add to that. One of the things that was interesting when I read your book was, you know, the, the imbalance um, between, you know, China has, um, has quite a lot of uh, academic input um, uh, emphasis on Southeast Asia and Southeast Asian studies, whereas uh, many of these countries don't have uh, China studies centers or China studies mm. programs themselves. Yeah. Yeah. The one that f freaked me out maybe the most was that Myanmar doesn't have any China scholars. <laughs> what the heck? How can they, how can the government figure out what to do with that, uh, with China? Um, if you interview young people, they say, I'd rather go to the US or London or or Australia, uh, but I can't, I can't afford it. So my family can't afford it. So I got a scholarship from the Chinese. So I'm gonna accept that. Um, better an education than nothing. Um, uh, the other thing they say is I, uh, I, I'm learning, I learned Chinese and now I got a job with a Chinese company and I'm paid very well. So they see those kind of opportunities just like people with, learning English earlier saw. Um, and it doesn't create um, uh, necessarily people that are totally that 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 move into the Chinese camp. I some of my most inter interesting interviews uh, for the book and countries was somebody who'd gone got a higher education degree in China, really understood China, and then went home and could understand what China was doing far better than the people that didn't know how China operated. So they, they actually are creating also a group of people that understand them and are, are willing to maybe stand up to them. But they are meeting a need. Uh, and in places like Malaysia and Laos, well, not in Laos, but in, in Malaysia, they they set up had their own universities at, alongside the British and Australian, and it, it's meeting a need. Um, let's shift to uh, to minorities, ethnic minorities in Southeast Asia. Um, Steve Custer asks about the you know given the situation with the Rohingya in um, in Myanmar, Tibetans, Uyghurs in China, um, does China's growing presence in the region? Um, what does that suggest for ethnic minorities um, in Southeast Asia? And that, that, that's, of course, a very broad, um, there's, there's a lot of different situations there to think about, right, between China's own connections with uh, minorities in Myanmar and the, the armed insurgents there mm -hmm. along the border and those issues. But then there's also been, you, you raise in your book, the question of Uyghurs, um, different policies of some, sometimes being sent back to China, sometimes not. Um, and then, of course, the Rohingya in, in Myanmar, you begin your book, or you know, early on in your book, you discuss quite a bit about the way that um, uh, the, the kind of falling out of relations between Myanmar and the Obama administration over this um, kind of opened the door for China in, some, in certain ways. Right. Um, I, I don't think generally it'll have a huge impact on minorities. Uh, but of course, you alluded already to the, the minorities along the, the whole swath of Chinese, China's border, those eth ethnic people, the, the ethnic people there, they have relatives on both sides. And uh, they're constantly moving back and forth. And to them, they don't have passports or don't even know which country they're from, right? And the same is true in Laos on the northern border. And the same is really true in Vietnam. They just move back and forth. And I don't think for the most part, it's having much of an impact uh, on them. Um, uh, the, the Uyghurs, that's uh, you know, an exception. Um, uh, 
partially, you know, they I think they they saw the advantages of of for for Myanmar getting rid of them, um, that they wouldn't have this challenge anymore of the such a hated group in Myanmar, um, and so China was ready to to support them while they're doing this. But I don't see anybody else really going after. I might be missing something. I hadn't th I hadn't thought of it in that sense of minorities, but. I think the people on the border function quite normally. Um, and actually, um, you know, it's interesting, uh, M Myanmar on the border is a whole nother story in a kettle of wax, right? So there's some 20 some militaries, ethnic militaries functioning along the border. Some are close, closer to Thailand, but um, they're all ethnic armies and they're the uh, uh, all getting, not all, but the main ones are getting armed by the Chinese, which then flies them to Naypyidaw, the capital for their Panglong talks about peace. Well, it's kind of, and then the Chinese businessmen are making money off the rubies and gems and, and uh, timber and all that stuff they're hauling out. So on the one hand, they're, they, oh yes, we they're trying to cooperate with the government. And on the other hand, they're supporting the insurgents against the government and arming them, which causes the military often to complain they got better weapons than we have. That's a very complicated situation. Very complicated. Yeah. <laughs> That's you know, it's it's one thing we get out of your book is is that level of complexity. Um, or I mean, just in terms of how complex the region is, how different each um each of these countries is from each other in different regions within uh, the countries as well. Um, so very difficult to make any kind of broad claims about it. Um, but here's a question from James Jehuson about um, whether or not, you know, can you assess the level of nationalism uh, in Southeast Asia? Speaking of <laughs> trying to pull together complexities into simple messages, right? Um, nationalism <laughs> is certainly one of those. Um, you know, and he goes on in, in, uh, to say, you know, Singapore has worked hard uh, at national definition. Vietnam has historically has had a stronger self-definition vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. And so not surprisingly, are more guarded about China's influence. But the others appear to concede much to China, especially when the elites enjoy various economic and political benefits. Uh, so despite their occasional grumbling and disquiet on the ground, could one anticipate on the whole pretty weak nationalist response to China's growing control and influence? Yeah, that's that's a good question. I try to figure that out um, if, if, if at some point people would just have had enough. Um, there's you in every single country, you have people mumbling about it, about the Chinese play too heavy a role. Uh, there's and they exaggerate. You know, like in Indonesia, you hear stories, there's a million people building this one project and they just moved all these guys in there. And you say, that's, you know, that's not, that's doesn't make any sense. Um, they couldn't have a million people there. They might have 2000, that'd be a lot. Um, uh, Vietnam, yeah, it, it's the Vietnamese government, actually, uh, you might remember in 2018, uh, the government, uh, the National Assembly was gonna pass a special economic zone law and the population figured, and, and the, that law, the draft of it said nothing about Chinese. It didn't apply to China more than the Japanese or Americans, at least on paper. But, but people protested uh, very vociferously and uh, the government was forced to uh, shelve the law and they haven't passed it yet. Uh, and whenever China starts kicking up its heels in the South China Sea, the population tries to protest, the government tries to stop, stop them. Uh, the Philippines is, has, now has a government that's very so, sort of pro-Chinese by Duterte, but the population is terribly anti-Chinese and very pro-American. Um, then other countries like, like, like Thailand is quite, it's surprisingly pro-Chinese. Uh, and that's partially because <laughs> Chinese are intermarried and, you know, and are, you know, and so broadly that you don't even know half the time if somebody's Chinese or Thai. Um, 
uh, Malaysia has had its times where where it's been pretty difficult. It had difficult had uh, anti Chinese uh, riots in 1969. Um, uh, yeah, so the big and 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 Myanmar is terribly nationalist, and that's why the the Chinese can't get their projects off the ground. The people just are very worried and Aung San Suu Kyi realizes that, and, and it, the thing that surprises you, the military kept the, the, the Chinese military kept the Myanmar military in power throughout the sanctions by the US and everybody else that only ended in 2012 or so. And yet the Myanmar military, you talk to the military about China and they, I mean, smoke comes out of their ears. They are really very anti-Chinese. They, you know, they, they, you know, some stories that I was telling you before about they arming the minorities who shoot them up. But, um, yeah, I think that the the it's hard. Like, yeah, you just, it's you can't give them one simple answer. But there is quite a bit of nationalism and anti-China sentiment in every country, even Cambodia. Have you seen Have you seen nationalism on the increase uh, in relation to China? Oh, certainly in Vietnam. Um, uh, and, um, I don't know. I wouldn't say I've seen it anywhere else as clearly. Mm -hmm. um, but in Vietnam, it's what, what China's done is really, really set the population off. And the, the Vietnamese are a little bit like Canadians, right? They're the only thing that separates them is they're not not American. <laughs> right. right. No, but I mean, and you be, you begin the you begin your book with that anecdote. Um, of visiting the border, uh, the China-Vietnam border, shortly after the, uh, shortly after the war, I think it was the '79 uh, invasion, in, yeah, in the late 1970s, early 1980s, um, and so I think that that experience is still quite recent memory for a lot of people. Um, yeah. Uh, Robert now has a question. If we want to shift back over to uh, trade um, about the recep. Um, and in particular, its relationship to the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, uh, often these, uh, he, he remarks, often these regional trade agreements do not amount to much. Um, what are the prospects for the RECEP? Well, um, so really what the goals of that agreement were is to harmonize the different agreements, trade agreements that Southeast Asia had with all the other countries, Australia, New Zealand, India, India dropped out, uh, Japan, uh, Korea, and China. And so a lot of the tariffs had been taken down years ago, but it's really an effort at harmonization. Um, I, it'll, you know, the, um, the, Inst the Peterson Institute for International Economics has done some, uh, uh, studies, which I have read, but I'm now forgetting exactly the number uh, that it's expected that the economies are expected to grow because of the the RCEP, but it's it's really quite quite small. Um, but it but it, it does have a big impact on companies that want to move goods between um, between countries, and it's it's it's. Uh, uh, um, digitalize the whole customs process uh, to a great extent. And even U.S. companies could benefit if you produce something in Malaysia and want to sell it to send it to Indonesia, you're, you can benefit. You can get, you can get a Malay, Malaysia preferences rather than have to have to respond, uh, you know, register as an American company. Um, I, we are. Uh, I'm going to just say one other thing. Trade agreements are often more political than they are. They are are economic. And the big thing of it is, of course, that that uh, China and Japan are in agreement. China and Korea, for heaven's sake, that can't get along are in an agreement. Uh, in an agreement, and uh, I think that's significant. Yeah. 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 That that's a that's really true. Um, I just wanted to say, you know, we'll we'll keep you for about another ten minutes, uh, so we'll try to get to a couple more questions if we can. Um, but I want to um, ask if uh, if Liza would go ahead. Um, some people might not have 
uh, might have logged on later. If we could put the um, link to the book uh, flyer in the chat again, uh, Liza, um, and people can find that. Um, you can click on that link and you can get a, um, a discount on the book um, with, a, uh, with a publisher's code, I think. So take a look at that if you're interested in, in, in picking up a copy of the book. Um, and again, sorry, I'm not gonna be able, we, there's still quite a few questions and we don't think we're gonna have time to get to all of them in the next um, eight, nine minutes. But um, uh, why you low asks a question about imperialism in, in, in the long term. Um, many of these Southeast Asian countries uh, uh, are former British, French, and Dutch colonies. Um, do China's actions in the region today intersect with the legacies of European colonialism? Um, and if so, how? Well, I, yeah, that's that's a good point. They uh, so all everybody except Thailand uh, became independent after World War II. Malaysia, Singapore in the in the fifties, um, Vietnam. I don't know exactly when it happened. I guess in the fifties. Um, uh, but yeah, they because of that experience, they're very sensitive to uh, what China might be doing. And they, you know, you ask them this and they think, well, China is not trying to do, is not going, uh, doing nearly what those countries were doing to us, where Indonesia was actually colonized, not by a country, but by the, the East India Company. And they feel kind of offended by, they couldn't even colonize, colonize by, by the Dutch. Um, um, yeah, so I, I think they generally, that has sharpened their sensitivities, the, the colonial period sharpened their sensitivities to what China is doing. And then, so if, if, if China is too heavy handed, uh, they do push back as a result. Uh, and there's been cases like a, a, a mine, uh, the uh, 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 copper mine in Myanmar where it was basically controlled by the Chinese and the far local and they got such a terrible deal the farmers protested and forced China the Chinese companies to partially divest to Myanmar companies and then do a, a corporate social responsibility kind of stuff every year they have to spend I think two million or something in the uh, US dollars in the neighborhood providing schools and clinics and roads and stuff like that. So those are the you know the kind of feelings that that come up pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just gonna I'm gonna give Darren Byler the final question here, um, and he's asking about uh, dreams and aspirations. <laughs> so it seems like a fitting question to go out on. Um, and he writes that you know before the BRI, the catchphrase of the Xi Jinping administration was the China dream. Um, a variation on the American dream. So, you know, how does this type of aspirational language or thinking, you know, how has this been taken up in Southeast Asian uh, nations? Uh, what do leaders and or regular citizens aspire towards? Um, and how, if at all, does China figure into those aspirations? Um, well, I mean, they, they are like everybody else just wants to have a middle-class lifestyle, I guess, right? Their kids educated and, um, they all want a television and all that kind of stuff and the internet and Facebook. Uh, but uh, more seriously, um, uh, yeah, they're just all trying to build up their countries uh, to be, you know, have, have uh, you know, good healthcare systems and, and strong transportation systems, good economy that provides jobs for your school leavers and that kind of thing. Um, and China plays into that even from early on when, when um, Deng Xiaoping opened, uh, opened up, uh, up the economy and told people basically to go abroad and start. So they would, Chinese went abroad almost right away uh, in, the, in the 80s, early 80s. And people you know, in, in remote areas of Southeast Asia see China as having brought new you know, water buckets and cooking utensils and, you know, all kinds of, of small uh, technology, uh, simple technology that they didn't have so much before. And so China is viewed as a major player in that. The U.S. they view as way too high up in, in its technology to be very useful, and Japan's also. So 
uh, China had sort of economically more suitable technology that it brought across from especially the border provinces. And so, yeah, China is, it, initially it was, it was much more organic. Now it is much more, uh, uh, it was individuals doing it before. Now it is much more um, organized by the state. And uh, uh, and even then, you know, the Laos Railroad, it's very, you know, unless the Thais build a railroad, which is not sure okay, at all. Soon. Yeah. So what's that railroad going to do? You know, haul mangoes and water buffalo from from Vientiane to to Kunming in China. I mean, it's kind of ridiculous. You know, you don't need a mid speed rail for that. A very expensive rail. Um, so um, I, um, so yeah, they're probably less enthralled right now. You go in Ben Chan, you know, all the architecture is now, a lot of the architecture in this town is, city is being, you know, very Ch Chinese-like, you know, instead of having, the, and, and same in, in, in Phnom Penh, instead of having the Buddhist curved roofs and stuff, you have suddenly little square boxes and looks like Beijing or, you know, any little Kunming or any little city in China, not that they're little, but any city in China. So, yeah. And yet they're their neighbors and they're, they're saying, absolutely, we're, we're not going to, you know, we can't live without them. We're next door to them. We're, we can't drag ourselves off to Australia. We're here. So um, we have to find ways to live together. Yeah. Well, great. Um, on that note, and and you know, one thing we didn't really get to, but I, you know, I don't think we have time. Is 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 we, the the fact that you finished your book uh, during the during the pandemic and during a time when um, the the terrain was really shifting dramatically because of that, in terms of uh, what's going on in Southeast Asia and how Southeast Asia might. Um, might uh, emerge from that and how that has shaped or will shape the continuing relationships uh, between those countries and, and China. Um, something to be looking for um, in, the, in, the, in the future. But uh, as it is, the book is a, is, is a real achievement. Um, it's an incredible resource um, for people like me who, uh, you know, um, interested in what China is doing in the region, but not a lot of, not a lot of experience in the region yet. Um, and so uh, congratulations and thanks again for, for doing it. And thanks again for joining us for um, the past hour and a half, uh, answering our questions uh, and being so generous with your time. It's really, really appreciated. Great, it was a pleasure, thanks. And thanks to everybody that uh, stuck it out and listened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank yeah. you all. <laughs>